Hey, future respiratory therapist, Gathry's got another question. Wants to know when is the right time or when do we initiate pressure control ventilation? Okay, now, um, of course, initiating pressure control ventilation or initiating any type of mode of mechanical ventilation becomes patient specific, but there are a few, uh, there are a few uh, key concepts that you need to understand when you're talking about mechanical ventilation and specifically initiating pressure control. Now, pressure control in some regions is actually the initial mode of choice, okay? It's typically not, especially when you're taking your MBRC exam, uh, in most of those cases. Um, it's typically not here in uh, the south region where I'm located. It's typically not. We typically go into a volume mode of ventilation. So um, today's video is gonna be more on when to go into pressure control ventilation when volume control is telling you things about your patient, okay? Now, the other thing I wanna talk about real quick before we get into the details of when we actually initiate pressure control is, I've heard it said before that get them out of volume control, put them in pressure control because that's how we breathe. We, we breathe naturally based off of pressure, not based off of volume, okay? And while that's somewhat true, because as you know, we do breathe off of the drop of the diaphragm, creates a pressure gradient, air goes in, air comes out, okay, based off of pressure gradient. So that's all it is. But you need to understand there's a difference in positive pressure ventilation versus negative pressure ventilation, which is what we do when we breathe normal. The diaphragm drops, it creates a negative pressure and air comes in. With positive pressure or pressure control, you're talking about pushing air in against either a steady diaphragm, or maybe the diaphragm's dropping, but you're pushing air in. It's not the result of a changing pressure gradient from the decrease in intrathoracic pressure. So I wanna clarify that real quick. If you ever hear that statement made or said, I want you to be able to be confident as a respiratory therapist that they can go, wait a second, that's, yeah, we breathe off of pressure changes, but we don't breathe off of positive pressure like what you get with pressure control, okay? So I wanna clarify that first. Now, let's get into this. We're gonna keep it real um, vanilla and in the beginning, and then we're gonna talk about some, some um, at least one scenario where these things that I'm gonna say may not exactly fit, okay, what you're talking about. So, or what you're, what you're experiencing or what you're seeing at the bedside, okay? So, uh, when to initiate pressure control. Now, this is when you're in volume control and you've, you're getting data and I don't know when to go in to pressure control, okay? Two big concepts here. This is an increase in pressures or oxygenation is your problem, okay? So the patient's ventilating fine, but they are not oxygenating worth the crap. Okay, so we're going to talk about this one second after we talk about increase in pressure. I'm going to put an S up here because this is pressures. This is key, okay? Because when we talk about mechanical ventilation, there's lots of pressures. The two big ones that you need to be thinking about here are your peak and your plateau, okay? So if you have a patient in volume control ventilation, and their peak inspiratory pressures are going up. If they creep into the 40s, the 50s, hopefully you're not letting peak pressures creep into the 60s, okay? If your alarms aren't set correctly, then maybe it happens, I don't know. But hopefully you're not letting peak pressures get into the 60s, but definitely when they start getting in the 40s, the mid, the high 40s, and into the 50s, you have got to consider that barotrauma is becoming a real factor here. Now, peak inspiratory pressure can be the result of increase in airway resistance or a decrease in your um, parenchymal compliance. So peak pressure by itself doesn't really tell you what's going on. It just tells you, hey, pressures in the airway and alveoli or, and or in alveoli are up. And you don't want trauma to happen from you pounding 16, 18 breaths a minute into somebody getting 48 centimeters of water pressure. So you could probably consider, I'm gonna to go to pressure control. This would allow me to control the peak inspiratory pressure, give a longer eye time, and still achieve a required minute ventilation for my patient, okay? Which would bring down the risk of 
those that barrel trauma happening with those high peak airway pressures. Now, the other one is if you have an increase in plaque. Now, I know what you're thinking, like, well, if you have an increase in peak, then you're going to have an increase in plaque. No, you're not. You can have, take asthma, for example, high airway resistance, lots of, of small, tiny airways constricted, high peak inspiratory pressure, nothing wrong with alveoli, so you have a low alveolar compliance, which is your static compliance, which is evidenced and, and visualized through your plateau pressure, okay? So if your plateau pressure starts creeping up above 30, you need to think, eh, I don't like this because this is an indication of, of a worsening compliance at the alveolar level, at the parenchymal level, okay? So you want to consider that. Now, now you may be thinking, well, if your plaque goes up, then your peak goes up, and you're right on that. So plaque does drive peak in the same way because if the alveoli becomes stiff, then your plaque's going to go up, your plateau pressure is going to go up. If your alveoli becomes stiff, remember peak is airway and alveolar compliant, airway resistance and alveolar compliance, then it will go up also. But here's why you can't just look at your peak. Because let's say you had a peak of 36 and a plateau of 33, right? If you're just looking at your peak, you're going to go, okay, I don't really like this. I could li I'd like for this to be lower, but, but I'm not really right now thinking about go into pressure control. Or when you look at it with your plateau, you go, oh, wait a second. This is all alveolar compliance issues I'm dealing with here. Because your peak is 36 because your alveolar compliance is crap. Okay? So in this case, this 36 may not be an indication to go to pressure control. But your plateau greater than 30 is an indication to consider pressure control ventilation, okay? That's how you have to think about it when you're monitoring your airway pressures. Don't just write the numbers down. Think about them. Peak, plat, map. Think about all of those pressures, okay? Because they're telling you something about your patient and about the airway resistance and about the compliance of your patient's alveolar units, okay? Now, the other one I brought here was when you have an oxygenation problem. So you have uh, decrease oxygenation. This would be evident by something that was, let's say, let's say you had somebody on um, a peep of a peep of twelve and eighty percent, and and you you your PaO two was seventy. You would agree that that's an oxygenation problem, right? Their PF ratio is less than a hundred. Okay, so PF, you know, see that equals. If your PaO2 is 70 and your and your FO2 is 80, then 70, 70 divided by 0.80 is 87.5. Okay. Now we know that your PF ratio should be above 300. Okay, anything less than that, you start talking about acute lung injury, ARDS, severe hypoxemia, things like that. And that's what this is indicative of. Anytime you have a PF ratio less than 100, you've got an oxygenation problem. Okay, so how do we want to fix this? Well, when you think about oxygenation problems, there's a couple things you can do. You can, one, increase FIO2. We're already on 80%. You think, you think taking them to 90 is going to fix this? No. Right? Your PF ratio is still going to be 87.5. Your PaO2 goes up a little bit, but now you're on 90%. You don't want to take them to 100, still doesn't fix the problem, right? This is called refractory hypoxemia. You increase FiO2 without a significant rise in your PaO2. You're looking at going, okay, there is a massive shunt present. Venous admixture is, is pulling my PaO2 down through the shunted region of the lungs, pneumonia, atelectasis, um, um, pulmonary edema, okay, just to name a few. All of those are shunts that are going to decrease your PaO2 through venous admixture, okay? This is the deoxygenated blood that passes through the shunted region, returns to the left side of the heart, mixes with the oxygenated blood, and pulls down the overall total O2 content of 
that arterial blood. So your PO2 goes down. Makes sense, right? I got off a little bit on this, on this PF and this oxygenation, but it's important to understand what's going on here. You just can't just keep turning up the FIO2. It doesn't fix the problem. The problem is a shunt. How do you fix a shunt? With positive pressure. You've got to re, um, recruit alveoli. You've got to increase surface area. And you've got to get more functioning units at the alveolar level. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, like I said, increasing oxygenation. One, you can increase FIO2, but that's not the best option. Okay, how do we increase functioning units at the alveolar level? Well, you can increase PEEP, but in this scenario, they were already on a PEEP of 12. Okay, so maybe you don't want to go up anymore on PEEP. Okay, or you can ultimately increase mean airway pressure. Now, increasing PEEP just so happens to also increase mean airway pressure. That's actually how PEEP works to increase oxygenation because it increases mean airway pressure, increases surface area, and allows for better diffusion uh, of oxygen across the AC membrane. Okay, now, if PEEP is out, then our only option left is for MAP. Now, here's the part where it gets tricky. How does pressure control increase MAP, mean airway pressure, versus volume control? Well, it's very simple. So I'm going to grab this and um, give you a visual over here, okay? When you're in volume control, this is your pressure waveform. When you give a breath, let's say you got a little bit of peak, the breath comes up like such and then back down. This is a pressure waveform in volume control, okay? All of this underneath here. is your mean airway pressure. Okay, so you have a visual of it. That's what I love about you have a visual of it. You can see it. Now, when you go to pressure control, you're gonna give a little longer eye time. Okay, longer eye time. But your waveform becomes square. So here now is your gain in mean airway pressure. You gained all of this on top of what you already had here. So your mean airway pressure obviously goes up and that will help improve, recruit more alveoli, improve FRC, and hopefully improve oxygenation. Those are the situations where you would consider going into pressure control. Now I told you there was one outlier kind of special scenario may not fit this model that I put up here, right? Let's take an emphysematic, for example. You know they're going to have an increase in compliance because their lungs are big and floppy, right? So you're probably not going to see high inspiratory pressures with them. And they may not be having an oxygenation problem. So you would never think to yourself, oh, I need to go to pressure control, right? Because my peak and my plateau are fine. My oxygenation is fine. So I'm not even going to think about pressure control. Stop right there because that's when you get in trouble. If you have an emphysematic who has evidence either on a chest x-ray or a CAT scan of, of excessive blebs, then you are at risk of barrel trauma with that patient, even at lower pressures. So you might want to consider pressure control early on in that process to prevent barrel trauma, which can lead to a pneumothorax and then you have another set of problems on your hands, okay? So that's kind of the one outlier. There's always exceptions. Always, always, always. If you're learning about respiratory therapy right now, I see people's Twitter posts and Instagram stuff, and people, I cry once a week in RT school. RT school so hard. Blah. Listen, it is hard, but you cannot forget the outliers. There's rules just like this, okay? Comment, you should think it through. It makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. But the outliers, the exceptions, are what sneak up and bite you when you miss them. Okay? So keep all these things in mind. Send me your questions, your comments. Hit the subscribe button. Hope everybody has a fantastic day.